This is Femi Kuti, and you are listening to NYC Radio Live. All right, how you doing, folks? David Ellen Bogan here. Uh, great to be with you. I got to hang with Martha Redbone, the great singer, composer, activist. Um, I'm sure I'm leaving out a few important parts of her multifaceted being, but I'm in a rush. <laughs> uh, there, she's going to be performing this Friday, actually, and um, at the David Rubenstein Atrium for a series produced by the India Center Foundation, Brooklyn Raga Massive, and Lincoln Center called Outside India. And yeah, I had the thrill of talking with her. But um, she also said we can share uh, this beautiful album that she has called The Garden of Love, Songs of William Blake. So let's start out with one, and then we get to hang out with Martha Redbone. Enjoy, and thanks for listening.
All right, I am here with Martha Redbone. Uh, really great to be with her on the, the cusp of a big show at Lincoln Center this Friday um, in the David Rubenstein Atrium, and it's a collaboration with um, Brooklyn Ragamassa. So thanks for taking the time to hang out. Thank you. Thanks yeah. for having me, David. Yeah, good to be with you. So uh, we don't have a ton of time, but I, I'd love to kind of get get the story. I mean, it seems like music came really early in your life. In my life? Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I guess so. But um, professionally, I would say, you know, that came in my 20s. Oh, really? You know, I think that music is in everybody's life, you know, at sure. a young age. But I think the, the turn from having it become a natural influence in your life to making making it a career you uh -huh. know a profession is a is is different but so i would say in my 20s i so something s something happened. something snapped yeah, yeah. <laughs> well um what's what happened um was um i wanted to be i wanted to write songs and um I had already been discovered and invited to sing on several recordings as a background vocalist. Mm -hmm. And um, and that, you know, I was pretty good at doing that and did a lot of sessions in, in London, England. But I really had this calling for wanting to tell stories, you know, and write songs. And I love melody, you know, having grown up in Kentucky and you know, in Appalachia and those sounds. So melody is something that's very strong. That's the kind of uh, defining line that goes right through any particular style for me. It's usually a strong melody mm -hmm. and then a really great story. So um, I decided to become a songwriter, you know, a lyricist. Mm -hmm. And I uh, began working with um, several producers and putting things together and then um, in that time through um, a mutual friend I met uh, my partner Aaron Whitby who is a fantastic um, musician pianist and producer and so we made the perfect kind of combination we had a great fit and uh, we shared we covered so such a vast uh, music vocabulary between the two of us um, we could write just about anything for anyone mm. and so we very quickly became a songwriting team uh, writing songs for myself and then um, some songs that we wrote sometimes for the sake of writing we ended up being able to place them with other artists and from there we uh, became this duo the dynamic du duo and it got a publishing deal and became uh, kind of in-house kind of staff wow. songwriters old school style yeah you, know? you don't hear that so much we anymore. did that yeah and we did you know there were loads of us you know in 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 england and also here in the states who basically you know write songs for other you know pop mm -hmm. artists and international artists and things and this so was like in the 80s this was in the 90s 90s yeah, the 90s so it's still 90s, happening in the 90s oh that absolutely this is like more like the, the late 90s okay and um, just as a lot of those companies were kind of emerging and mm -hmm. becoming new things. So that was a, an interesting time for music in general. It, as a, a music style, s styles were emerging. We had um, pe people were figuring out ways to make um, the hip hop beats and apply those to all different other genres and a lot of kind of hybrids, mm. uh, forms of of um pop songwriting so to speak and uh any notable like songs that we might or artists that we might know of um no uh most of them were international artists most of them oh. were artists in can in canada there was a um god i don't even remember there was a, a british artist called uh shola ama and um she's a brit a british she won like m many um, mm -hmm. British music awards equivalents right. to you know I guess British Grammys I guess right and um, and then uh, there was another uh, pop artist who came out of France and then um, and then someone in Canada 
It's very hard to remember. There's so so many right. you know that we wrote. Right. Or so anyway, yeah. So you're getting you're starting to get these big long checks, the publishing checks. <laughs> kind of, sort of. Okay, you know, but not you know but, not as big as we would okay. like. But, well, I meant um, actually they're just the size. <laughs> so usually, I, I exactly. But not the, not the <laughs> physically big. Yeah. So, um, but um, yeah. one of the one of the things that I I'd, I'd like to mention is it, part of our music journey and. Um, production values journey that Aaron and I um, really attribute to was being mentored by Junie Morrison from Parliament Funkadelic, oh, right. who was a, a huge uh, influence for us in our early stages of you know honing our our skills and mm. our studio styles, you know, and techniques yeah. and things like that. And uh, Junie was living in London at the time, and when we met and um and he mentored us and we ended up performing on the um the mothership reunion record nice you know for for george and that was really amazing yeah. just being a part of that whole process um and in the world of you know being a junior funkadelic sure. so that was really great fun can you were there any like specific kind of songwriting lessons or production techniques that you could like think of like little little bits of wisdom that he kind of passed along? Oh, absolutely. He said one of the things that he said was um you will probably have the most success with your least favorite song. <laughs> <laughs> And then the other things that he's also said was, um, you know, um, yeah, he said you would probably have the most success with your least favorite song. Something that you really absolutely hate about something that you've written will probably be the most popular. Wow. That probably applies like across Just the so board. The irony, a, the irony of uh, success, right. I guess, in, in music. Yeah. Um, because... You know, when you're w one of the, the beautiful things about, you know, being mentored by the folks in Parliament Funkadelic is that anything goes. You know, these are genius musicians, masters at their craft, sure. master singers and mm -hmm. players, you know, of every instrument, you know, because they came from the era where you had to be not just good at something, but everybody got an instrument and you excelled. Yeah. It. And um, and these were, you know, people from the Midwest, you know, and the, and the suburbs. Mm -hmm. So it was really a, a a wonderful thing to be in an environment where if you heard a melody that sounded like the blues or country or rock and roll, you know, that it was OK. And if you wanted mm -hmm. to sing with a, you know, like a kind of heavy metal rock voice, that was fine. That worked as well, mm -hmm. you know, and then. You know, the stories that you could tell could be funny. You know, right. love could be funny. Love songs could be hilarious, mm. you know, or a perspective about one particular thing. Like, you know, the, for example, like you want to, I want to use, um, you know, not just knee deep, you know. Mm. Um, it's about dancing, but the way that they, you know, visualize it. And how they put it into words, and what you're, you know, what you're looking for, It's just such an uh, such an interesting and I think genius way of, mm. of um, basically writing a song about having a lot of fun. So, do you think um, they play with words a lot? Yeah. that's what I was getting yeah. at. Yeah. Do you do you do you think that from the from your like inside perspective that the big contribution of parliament funk funkadelic was this wide openness kind of thing like uh absolutely i think um i kind of compare it and i often imagine you know if Jimi hendrix were alive you mm -hmm. know we're still alive i mean he would fit right in because i think the the hybrid crossover was was Jimi hendrix and then i think from there you know um George Clinton and and all those guys, you know, it w it it was, it was the days of free love, you know, when mm -hmm. when the when these different styles were all together. I mean, you can hear Crosby, Stills and Nash in their music, and you hear, I hear P Funk in Crosby, Stills and Nash. I hear right. those harmonies and those, um, those arrangements. You can hear the 
all of these styles cross over into each other during that time. I think that was a really beautiful time of of music and you know, we're really very lucky to have that era, you know, recorded yeah. and available. Yeah, and it's not even just the music. I mean, it's almost the way things sounded, the way the instruments sounded, the way things recording sounded, like uh it it's yeah, it seems like that in a, there was in a some thousand magical, years they'll be yeah. listening to the 1970s and yeah, 60s. There was yeah, so, there was a, yeah. it was a magical time when a lot of things fell into place and a lot of different styles had, had already existed by then. And I think that putting them together was a new form of what I call folk music, mm. you know, because it came from all folk, you know. Right. So. But that's an interesting tie into your music because I, I feel like you seem like w- an artist that doesn't particularly want to be constrained by genre, the genre police, right? <laughs> you know, um, and I don't know. I guess, I guess we could take it from there. So, so mm-hmm. this happened, and, and you had this uh, super inspirational period, mm. and you're writing songs, and then when when do you make the leap that you say? Uh, yeah, okay. I think. Um, I think that beginning phase, you know, the beginning Mm -hmm. of our professional music career. um, And I, you know, I'm speaking for Aaron because the music comes from both of us. It's Mm -hmm. a a real team, a true team. And uh, it's been a team for 25 years, you know. So um, I do believe that the experience of being mentored by Junie Morrison from Parliament Funkadelic, one thing that it taught us is that whatever you do is acceptable. Mm. You know? Right. That there are no rules. And if there's a rule, it's meant to be broken. You know, you're meant... It's art. Right. It's art and it's creation. So they're really... They showed us and proved to the world that there are no boundaries. Mm when it comes to art right and and we have to we must remember that as the creative person you know that there are no boundaries Mm. when you're experimenting when you're um discovering art otherwise if you set all these boundaries then we don't grow and then we might as well just copy the next thing right and um and i think that that's you know that it's almost like an, it's an inhuman form to to place boundaries on things and and um categorizing is not really the job of the of the artists of the musician that's not our job there are people who get paid lots of money to figure out ways to to market and sell these things but it's not our job to even to even think about it right you know, because once we start thinking about it, then we start limiting ourselves, and that's what you don't want to do. I rose up at the dawn of the day, get thee away, get thee away, praise thou for riches, away, away. This is the throne of mammon gray. Said I, this sure is very odd. I took it to be the throne of God. For everything besides I have, it is only for riches that I can crave. I have mental joy and mental health and mental friends and mental Sins by my side don't stand, and he holds my money bag in his hand. For my worldly things, God makes him pay, and he'd pay for more if to him I would pray. And so you may do the worst you can do, be assured, Mr. Devil. Say. 
Indian classical rag is that was that something on your plate of of listening to and it's funny that you say that but about a, a year ago um a bit over a year ago I discovered some beautiful um classical music f- Indian music mm-hmm. from India and uh it was on the YouTube and the sounds it stopped me in my tracks because it sounded like um, slide guitar from from Appalachia, mm. and I was completely blown away by it. And I saved the link, and I just saved it in my computer. And then, you know, a year and a half later, we got a, f- a call from Samir, who said, um, "Who's asked? Who asked? Invited us to perform and." in this series that he created called Outside India. And um, we we talked about combining our styles, Mm -hmm. you know, with the mountain music of India meets the mountain music of America. Right. And it immediately just brought me back to that, um, that YouTube link that I found. Right which I had in my, in my phone. And so, of course, we jumped at the chance to do something like that. And we thought, well, you know, outside India, and India and Indian mm-hmm. as an American, Indian, Indian and Native American. And um, and this is something that I'm, we've never done before with uh, classical Indian music. We've never done this before. I have, uh, have always wanted to do it. I just mm. never knew how to go about doing it. And um, but we have been um, experimenting with other particular, you know, other styles of of music. But this is going to be absolutely magical. I mean, we're we just came from rehearsal and we're buzzing. Just I have Great. so many uh, sounds in my in my head in my mind. It's kind of hard for me to even talk properly because it's going to be so exciting. Wow. I, it was just a, a a beautiful experience. I knew it would be, mm-hmm. um, and it, it surpassed my my imagination. Good. So I'm I'm very very excited about trying. Yeah. It. You know, I'm hearing y- your voice, I mean, it's like really obvious that there's uh, some strong rootedness in, in gospel tradition and this kind of thing. And to me. Gospel music, just the way that someone like Mahalia Jackson sings, it's like it's inherently, I don't know if the word is rebellious, but maybe it is. It's mm. it, there's it's so assertive that it seems... It's arresting. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I wonder what your I do, take I is think on that. I do. I, I, I agree with that. And also, um, there's a, what's the word, a kind of tautness. Mm. Um, in that style of of singing, and it's it's um. I also kind of equate that gospel style of singing with uh, traditional Native American mm. singing as well. You know, with our the vocables that we sing, which we are also combining in this music on yeah. Friday. It it you you really you feel a. a a great similarity between the, you know, gospel and yeah. traditional Native American vocal style. Absolutely. Maybe you can enlighten me. Uh, someone was just telling me uh, a, um, a movie came, a documentary came out about kind of the Native American influence on the blues. And I think it was, might have been Sun House or one of these guys had Native American roots in that 
a lot of actually certain songs and and parts of the idiom actually have Native American roots. You, you Almost know? all, uh, yeah. everything. Yeah. I mean, when this is American music, mm -hmm. and before anyone else came, this was the yeah. sound of America. Yeah. And so that has to be the foundation from mm. where everything else must sure. be built upon. And so when you hear it in blues, there's also a book called um, Indian Blues by uh, John Troutman, Troutman, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and which talks about about this influence on mm -hmm. blues, about the native influence on um, on the blues, but particularly in the southeast, where where my family's from, because we're Cherokee and Choctaw, Shawnee, mm -hmm. and African American, and um, you can hear it in the melodies. You can hear, uh, you you can hear it in the prayers, you know that the traditional prayers. You can hear it in all the stomp songs, the traditional stomp songs, mm. and um, and the the repetition that you hear, you know, from the mm. dances that we do, that repetition. Um, you hear that in the blues as well. So if, you know, someone comes from Africa and brings the banjo from Africa mm -hmm. and plays that melody line, <laughs> you know, you can hear that on the guitar, on the mm -hmm. banjo, and you'll hear, um, you know, someone sing you know, we got beans, cornbread, you know, you can hear that. And then you'll also hear the Choctaw people sing something, you know, similar to that, you know. It's exactly the same. Mm. And you can hear... I'm just giving you a, a quick, speedy sure, example sure. Yeah. of a of a southeastern stomp, um, but uh, you 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 hear the the line all the way from the beginning on all of it. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess it's kind of a history that's not as highlighted the the African American and and Native American like relationships. You know, yeah, I think um, it's it wasn't highlighted because if it were highlighted in a big way, then colonialism might have not happened. Mm. <laughs> right. So of course, you know, um, the, you know these groups of people will be downplayed, you sure. know, uh, as actually being together and and mm -hmm. and being communities that helped each other. So yeah. that's. That's how you, that's how you conquer new lands, you know, right. by saying particular things don't exist and wiping them away on paper. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so you, you you got this thing coming up Friday. You have some other uh, big things in the works, or yes, we have. Um, we're developing a a musical, and um, we've been doing many different iterations of of it, and. Uh, working with the public theater, which has been so much fun, Great. and um, talking about a family story, which involves Native and African American um, lineage and family members. So, um, based on my family back home, we also have, um, in the beginning of May, we have uh, a series of concerts for uh, New York City schools as part of Carnegie Hall's uh, Musical Explorers. All right, yeah, that's so great we have been uh, working with um, singing uh, traditional Southeastern Native American music, mm -hmm. teaching that to children. We also have, uh, we're going out to California at the end of April to Lubbock, Texas. So we're around. We, we have our website that and also social media. Sure. Um, to keep in touch with where where we'll be nice yeah and 
I mean, I'm sometimes I end up on the periphery of certain Native American events and this kind of thing. And it seems like there's been a little bit of a movement where Native Americans, like a kind of pan, pan tribal kind of situation where there's, there's a lot more, uh, maybe consolidation between, you know, is that, is that something that you've noticed? Is that, yeah, yeah, I think that that kind of pan, yes, pan Native American, uh, culture in a way, um, maybe it's happening by default mm -hmm. um and i also think it has a lot to do with uh organizations that mm -hmm. are forming to have you know festivals and things like that mm -hmm. um i think uh we have you know 573 federally recognized tribes with you know all <laughs> different languages and and dialects and different cultures and um, and lifestyles and and I think that um, you know it it's I think if people can have access to a little bit of what each of us is about each group is about and each family story if we're allowed to share our individual family stories I think that's the best way of um, uh, keeping us and acknowledging us for who we are mm you know, rather than kind of lumping us in to this kind of pan right. thing. I, I I tend to think that sometimes I, I find that, um, you know, American culture tends to try to lump people in mm -hmm. without looking at the individual. You know, we're just all people. All people are this or all people are that, this group. Sure. And it's... You know, I think it's really, um, it's wrong. Mm -hmm. It's not the way to learn about who we are and learn about each of us individually because we all each have so much to offer. I mean, you can't, you know, take a, a country like India and say that everyone is just in, you know what I mean? Sure. It's There's so many different styles yeah. of music and styles of, you know, food and language sure. and there's so many things it's such a huge difference from the north to the south mm -hmm. culture it's like how can you just lump it all right. how can anyone just lump that in and say that's what this is yeah it's only one part of it and um so my my hope is by sharing my family story i can help redefine these kind of pan epidemics mm -hmm. that are happening with right. regard to culture because i think that as humans we deserve better than that mm -hmm. you know than to just be generalized and closed up because there's so many this is the 21st century you know we we you know we we know better right now you know we know we should know better and we do know better and you know there's um social media and the internet and computers and research everything is at our fingertips these days we can find just about anything that we need to discover on the computer and if we don't see it on the computer we can ask someone mm -hmm. right. <laughs> and i think that's the best way to learn yeah that's the best yeah. way to learn about who we are there's a big difference between you know p people from Choctaw and people from, you know, to hold no mm -hmm. you know, or or Chickasaw and Chinook, you know, it's a huge mm -hmm. difference. And I think if we took the time to learn and even pronounce our names, I saw something that was really fantastic on the on the internet um, yesterday. There was an actress from Orange Is the New Black. And she has a very, um, her name is Uzumaka, Uzumaka, something like that. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. And she said that she hated her name. She grew up in Boston uh, in a Nigerian family. Her name is Uzumaka. And so when she was a little girl, she said to her mother, M Mama, can you m name me? I want to be called Zoe. And she said, Why? She said, because people don't know how to pronounce my name. I've been called 
as a Moka, as Mika, Uzuzuka, all of this. Mm. She said, it's just easier for people to s- call me Zoe, if I'm called Zoe. And she said, her mother said, if they can learn to pronounce Dostoyevsky, <laughs> Tchaikovsky, you know, and all of these names, they sure. can certainly learn to pronounce Uzumaka, mm. you know? And I, that's, that's how I feel about all of our names of where we come from and who we are. People can take yeah. the time to learn who we are. We deserve that respect as right. humans. Yeah, and you know, as you're talking, I'm, f- I'm feeling how, this feeling I get, how it's like the world is, is made up of story and it's made up of language, you know, and that's that's almost all, that's, that's like if we were fish, that's the water that we live in, right. you know? Right, right. Yeah, we just have to take the the time to learn it and respect it, you know, and each other. And um and I think we'll be fine. I think we'll be okay. <laughs> 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 so Yeah. All right. Well, on that hopeful note, uh <laughs> I guess uh we'll see you on Friday and um yeah, hopefully I I guess um Maybe there'll be some music. You'll have some music I can share on the podcast. Yeah, um, sure. Yes, yeah, okay. we can. We, from Friday show, we have some of our our um, yeah. recordings. We can. Yeah, I can enjoyed send that. For the, sure. the thing that I've heard is the William Blake album. Which yes. Really okay. Like. So that you have that. That's our yeah. latest um, okay. um, physically available one. I had a funny experience with William Blake. My my grandparents had. Um, one of his famous paintings, I'm sure you can think of it, it's probably like the most famous painting, a reproduction of that one, where there's an old man and he's like reaching down and there's kind of a pyramid mm-hmm. of light coming out. And when I was little, I, they had to take that off the wall because it like scared yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So yeah. uh, I guess there was something super fundamental in his thing that that must have hit you in the chest right yeah i think uh well aaron is the one who found uh rediscovered the book on our shelves <laughs> and um we just really love the language we absolutely fell in love with the the language and the the you forget how beautiful the english language can be you know there's so many ways of of um painting a picture mm. with with words and um, and me being a lyricist, you know, we have lots of poetry because I, you know, I love um, the way I love the play on words. I love the way words sound. I'm a singer. Right. Um, there are particular words that do not sing well. You know, um, the the poems that we chose of of William Blake's were uh, he originally wrote them as songs. So yeah, okay. the, the, these particular stanzas, you know, make sense. They, they they sing very well. It just, mm. it was such an easy organic flow to make these, to make these uh, settings for yeah. them. Yeah, and it, it, and it, and it works with that feel. Yeah, yeah it's it really was great. really lovely. And also John McEwen, who produced it with us, who um, made some beautiful arrangements mm-hmm. of it too. But the way that we wrote these songs were, and we wanted to stay true to the form that Blake wrote them in. So we sing them straight down as the way he, he wrote them. And then we only repeat them at the end right. to, keep oh, the, cool. to keep the integrity of yeah. the poem. And we didn't switch things around or anything. Right. It's a great, fun project to, to do. Yeah. A treasure trove. Mm. Yeah, it's it, I was trying to describe him to my girlfriend, and I was like, "Well, he's kind of like a mystic, right?" I mean, there's kind of, but they, the, I, I find that the ones that the poems that we chose were really um, the messages were very relevant mm-hmm. to modern times. I mean, these are poems that are over 250 years old, but he's still talking about, um, you know. Um, his longing for people to have compassion, mm. you know, compassion and have mercy for people, you know, and, and when someone is suffering, you know, have pity. The word pity changed its definition since the the original thing. 
when some someone um, is pitiful, it's you sp- you're sp- meant to show mercy. But the word pitiful means something different these days. Mm. It almost I think people are confusing the word pitiful with pathetic. Right, Pharaohs hardened our hearts. Yeah, and yeah. I think um, I think the the language of, and how he. It's there's a I've I found a couple of the su- the the poems that we found were really almost a Buddhist um, philosophy, right? You know of when you see someone suffering, you know you 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 it's your responsibility as a human to to help, you know, in in some way. And how can you not help? Right. You know, and yes, you may be suffering yourself, but to know that another person is suffering, that empathy there is what. I felt well. We this is something that the world needs to be reminded of again. So mm. we 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 chose um, poems that that spoke to us that way, and also uh, painted the imagery of for us of Appalachia, of what the mountains meant to us, and also things about religion. You know, mm. being part of the kind of Bible Belt. You know, in in Kentucky, and those mountains there, and what those what that language might have been like for people who you know, went to church in 1880. So mm. when you go back home, how does your music resonate? It's great. I mean, yeah. we, we just uh, came back from Kentucky. We had a, a wonderful concert in Louisville uh, with um, Ben Soli. We had a, a double bill, and we, and that was a r- really fantastic project. Another one where uh, we put our two bands together and learned each other's songs oh, cool. and then wrote a song together and then performed that for the audience and told s- Kentucky stories were Kentucky natives. So that was really great fun. Wow. Mm. All right. Well, y- I don't, I don't want to get in the way of your, <laughs> you have some fun in Chinatown coming up. So. <laughs> um, good. All right. Well, thanks for your time. Thank Can't you, wait David. for Friday. Thanks for all your music. And I'm sure there'll be, a lot more great things coming up. So yes, please do come. Uh, it's David Rubenstein Atrium. Yeah. It's seven thirty. Yeah, come early. It's going to be least packed. An hour early. That's the you sad do. Thing. Yeah. And um, but it's free. Yeah. And it is going to be amazing. It's a really beautiful yeah. room, and um, the best thing to do is come early because I think it will be really packed yeah. on a Friday night. It'll be great fun. Looking forward to it. And I'm really thankful to Samir Gupta for his vision and uh, and the India Center for helping make this happen. And uh, yes. Brooklyn Raga Massive. And yeah, Lincoln Center, uh, Mira Dugal. All right. Thank you, Martha. (laughs) Thank you.
into my garden snow when the night had veiled the pole in the morning glad I see my full outstretched in the 